joining this evening. Uh, we'll go ahead and share my screen, I guess, and we'll get started. All right. Looks like it's working. Yep. We'll move this off to the side just a little bit. All right, so again, uh, thanks for joining this evening. We have a pretty big task in front of us here, tackling native ferns or ferns just in general. Most of the ferns in Iowa are native. There's only, only one that I can think of that's not native. So um, I thought for a fun, maybe uh, during the course of this, anytime you wanna put into the chat, uh, kind of be interested in hearing what your favorite fern is, if you have a favorite. Maybe you'll develop a favorite as we go through here, go through the uh, pre presentation tonight. So, all right. So um, these again are the sources of images. Can't say enough about the um, value and having these kinds of pictures online, these kinds of photos. I do a lot of uh, putting this program together is really just basically a lot of time looking for the images that I need that are just right. And luckily, there's a lot of them out there that do a pretty good job. So again, I always want to um, give a shout out to that resource. We'll take a look at some of the um, things we'll be looking at, some of the ferns we'll be looking at here. I got, oh, come, it's not working. Here we go. Uh, that one that just came up there is, um, well, in Eilers and Rosa, it's Ethereum Pycnocarpin. It's a narrow leaf spleenwort fern. I photographed that one up in Effigy Mounds National Monument a few years ago. Then this one here is one we will be looking at in more detail along with the uh, spleenwort there. This is uh, Palaea labella. This is a smooth cliff break fern. This is one that you almost always find on rock. And this was photographed up in up in Northeast Iowa as well, up in the um, Iowa Natural Heritage Foundation's um, uh, 1,000 acre site there, up in, um, I think it might be Alan McKee County. And then this one right here is one, unfortunately I didn't get a chance to get into the program tonight, so it's nice just to mention it here. This is the Lyptris palustris, the marsh fern. So we look at the Eilers and Rosa, and this isn't, sorry, this isn't on your uh, handout. I, I viewed this up after I sent it to, to Lance. But just to give you an idea, um, Eilers and Rosa, which came out in 1994, has eight families in the uh, fern uh, division, basically. The uh, Polypodiophyta, which we'll get to in a little bit, eight families, 21 genera, 45 species. And again, one of those is non-native, the rest are all native. Of those, uh, 15 species are listed as either endangered, threatened, or special concern. So a third of them, which is pretty high. We're gonna look at 26 of these tonight. So we've got quite a few to go through, but um, hopefully these, some of these will be fairly common ones. Some of these are fairly easy to identify. Now, Flora of North America came out, actually one year before Eilers and Rosa came out, and of course, the nomenclature in Florida, North America is preferred, of course. Uh, we consider that to be a more accurate representation of what the phylogeny is. And you can see there's a couple of extra families. What happened really, the difference there is uh, three families were added, basically and one family was dropped from what Eilers and Rosa had. The, uh, the two new families are Adiantaceae, Dryopteridaceae, and Philoptraceae. 24 genera, so there are three genera that were added and 49 species, so there are four species that were included that Eilers and Rosa did, did not include. And we'll see these in the table that I put together for you. So let's take a look first at um, where do the ferns fit, in, excuse me, in the uh, kingdom of plants? So there's really two important features there whether or not there's vascular tissue present. And what we mean by that is true xylem and phloem tissue, which means it has to have um, uh, certain types of cells that make up the xylem and phloem tissue. 
And if it has true xylem and phloem, then we can say that it has true leaves, true stems, and true roots. The other important characteristic is you can see there will be what form of reproduction does the plant use? And either it'll be spores, which are just a single cell, a tiny single cell, or seeds, which are much, much more complex. They have many, many, many cells, hundreds to thousands of cells, and more complex tissue, tissues. So the first two you see up here, of course, the, I'm looking at the divisions. The first three divisions uh, are in the group that we often call the bryophyta, but they include the liverworts, hornworts, and mosses. You got a picture there of a, of a hornwort right here. Let me get my pointer here. All right, so yeah, here's the liverwort. This is Marcantia. This is, happens to be a female phallus. We see a couple of features here, the jemmy cup, which is a way for the liverwort to reproduce asexually. And then Archegonia 4, which is uh, where the gameta, where the, excuse me, where the gametes are gonna be produced. And here's a, a nice example of a typical moss over here, uh, the leafy gametophyte right here. Now it says stems and leaves, but remember we can't really call these stems and leaves. A lot of books, a lot of diagrams will call them stems and leaves, but that's not true because they're not, they don't have true vascular tissue. They don't have xylem and phloem tissue. There are a couple of terms that we use to describe then the, um, the leaves, phyllids. It's a term we use to describe a leaf-like structure that the mosses have. And there's another term for the stems as well. And we see that the leafy gametophyte, this part right here, gives rise to the sporophyte, which is the reproduction part right here where the capsule is produced, where the spores are going to be made. So when we look at this group again, there is no xylem and phloem, and reproduction, of course, is spores. So what happens in the next group, the pteridophytes, or the seedless vascular plants, and there's, uh, again, the four divisions that are present there. And here's an example of a club moss, Lycopodiophyta. Here's an example of horsetail and Equisotophyta. And here's our topic for tonight, a fern in the Polypodiophyta. Well, these all have vascular tissue. This is um, where plants have evolved to the point now where they're getting larger and bigger and they need vascular tissue in order to conduct water uh, throughout the entire plant to be more efficient and to conduct food back towards the, the root system. Or the, in most cases, what these plants have is a rhizome below ground and then roots that grow off of that. But these still produce spores. Uh, they are still reproducing by spores. So it's vascular, but seedless. So the seedless vascular plants is the way we refer to those four divisions. Then the next one, uh, the next two groups here, basically, the next uh, four divisions there are all in the gymnosperms, the cycads, ginkgos, conifers, and then this um, nidophyte group, which includes a couple of really strange plants. Uh, I just have a picture of a white pine here and a picture of a um, blood root here to exemplify uh, what a conifer would look like, of course, and what a flowering plant looks like. So we have another division down here, the magnolia, uh, magnolia offida. These, of course, all have xylem and phloem tissue, and they also produce seeds. So now that changes and again indicates a higher level of evolution, a huge significant step in, in that way because seeds are much, much more um, valuable and important in, in propagating the species and, and, and dispersing the species to new places. Of course, there's two different ways those seeds are presented in the gymnosperms they're found in cones and in the magnolia offida they're found inside fruits. So we're looking again at the polypodiophyta, one of the th uh, four divisions of the uh, what are called again pteridophytes or the seedless vascular plants. So a little bit of terminology would be helpful there of course in terms of fern morphology. Uh, when we look at a fern, we're always looking at leaves because the stem is below ground. The stem is that rhizome. This picture here is a nice one right here that shows again, well, they're, they're saying rootstock, but that's really not a very good word to use there. They do have rhizome right there. Those are not the same thing. A rhizome is what this is right here. And a rhizome is a stem that is below ground and usually horizontal. 
And then off of that stem, because what grows off of stems? Leaves. Leaves grow off of stems at nodes. And right here's a node with a leaf arising. And that's what we're seeing over here again with the rhizome and some roots that come off it. So the plant does have roots, of course, true roots, but they are adventitious roots because they grow off of this stem tissue. So there's um, this picture right here is, you know, maybe a good place to start. We've got a, a couple of, of leaves here again. We, we can call that entire leaf a frond. Frond is a term that's used to apply for or use for fern leaves. But the leaf can be divided into two parts, the blade, which is, of course is the expanded photosynthetic part, and the petiole. Now that's a term we use in any kind of leaf really, but again, when we're talking about a frond, another term that's often used instead of a petiole is a stipe. And this diagram right here shows again the, the petiole right here, and it, it uses the term petiole, and it uses the term stipe, and it also uses the term stalk. And where again, this part up here is, is the blade. Now, in ferns, what's going to be really important is looking at how much division occurs. Uh, we can have leaves that are simple, a fern frond that's simple, like this one right here, which means it's not divided into segments. It's the, the blade is just one complete uh, piece of tissue, you might say. Or we can get various kinds of divided leaves. And of course, the various kinds of divided leaves are what's most common in the ferns. So in this case here, we have um, a once compound leaf. So when the leaf becomes compound, what happens is the, the blade becomes divided into smaller segments or pieces that are, in theory, they need to be completely separate from other segments. And essentially what we're looking at then is in other leaves, we call those a leaf leaflet. For example, when you look at a, a leaf of box elder, for example, there is either three or five leaflets that make up the entire compound leaf. So we do use that term. You see that it shown right here in this diagram, uh, a leaflet or pinna. Pinna is a term that simply means a leaflet born along the rachis of a pinnately compound leaf. So when we have a compound leaf, again, we have the petiole down here or the stipe, and then after we see a, a first um, location where leaves or leaflets are attached, I should say leaflets are attached ultimately by this rachis here, the rest of this central axis is a rachis. And this would be the primary rachis right here because the primary rachis is an extension of the petiole. Now, in this case, we have another rachis coming off right here, and it's on this secondary rachis right here that we actually see the ultimate division of a leaf, and the term pineal is usually used to describe the ultimate or smallest division of a compound leaf, because a leaf can be divided once, like this one right here, so we just have a primary rachis and the leaflets are attached to it, or we could have a twice compound leaf, there we have a primary rachis, but then the actual leaflets or the pinules are attached to a secondary rachis, this rachis is coming out in both these directions here. So really, if you, if you could just simply count the number of rachi, the number of rachises that you have, that tells you whether it's you know, once compound, if it's just a primary, or if you have secondary rachi, then it's twice compound. Now, of course, ferns make things complicated. So what can often happen, and we kind of see this in this example right here, we uh, it's calling it panatophid, but the right term for this would be pinnate panatophid, because the term pinnate means that it is once compound, and it is once compound here at the base, at the proximal locations, because these segments here are completely separated from other segments. But as we go towards the distal end of this leaf, we see that those segments are not completely separated. There's tissue in here that connects these, these uh, segments. And so it's not completely divided. What instead is, this is just deeply lobed. The lead, the lead, at this point up here towards the proximal end is, is deeply lobed. And so panatophid means a leaf that is lobed. Usually the term panatophid means the leaf is lobed at least halfway down towards the rachis. This one is, is 
getting really close to the mid vein here. So it's almost to the point where we might call it panana sec because um, panana sec means it's, it's lobed almost down to the mid vein, meaning that the sinus is deeper than in a panatophid leaf. So the terms panatophid and panana sec are referring to a leaf that's divided, but not divided to the point where it's compound. It's just lobed. So divisions is a kind of a, can be kind of a confusing term sometime when people use, you know, it's a divided leaf. Well, a divided leaf means it could be divided into lobes, or it means it could be divided deep enough to actually separate those lobes into leaflets or pinnae. So the term pinna or pinnae, pinnae is the plural term, uh, is looking at the first division that comes off the primary rachis. So this, this is a, a pinna, this is the pinna. But the pinyol, again, is the smallest division, which we see right there. Okay, if, if you have any questions, put them in the chat. Now, the next part is the sexual part, the reproductive part. And since ferns reproduce with spores, they have to have sporangia. Sporangia are the structures that any plant, a moss plant, horsetail plant, whatever it might be that produces spores, they produce their spores in sporangia. And one of the important features of the polypodiophyta, the division of ferns that separates them from the other divisions, is the how those sporangia are arranged and how they are presented. Uh, another important difference between the polypodiophyta and the other groups is that um, the size of the leaves. Ferns have uh, what are called megaphils because they have leaves that have uh, lots of ve veination in them, whereas something like a club moss or a, a um, spike moss has what's called a microfill, because those are much smaller leaves and you only have a single vein, just one vein. It goes down the, down the center of the leaf. But anyway, we're looking at sporangia here, and in the ferns, the sporangia can be presented a variety of ways, but the most typical way is what you see right here, and, and this is the way that you know most people uh, probably learned about ferns, is that you look on the underside of the frond, the blade, um, on and on the pinna, you will see little brown spots often, as we see right here. And we look at look at those closer, <clears throat> and what those are, <clears throat> excuse me, is a is a saurus. So the term saurus is a cluster of sporangia. Here's a single saurus right here with a whole bunch of sporangia. Probably, probably, you know, 50 or more, at least in there. Tiny little sporangia. In general, the sporangia are have short little stalks. Here's a picture of a sporangia, uh, of a sporangia right here. So this is a little stalk. <clears throat> and then the sporangia part up here, the sporangia case where the spores are, are formed is up there at the top. I think of these as little lollipops. So in this diagram here, these little structures right here are the sporangia. And again, the typical way is to have them presented in a saurus in a large cluster, always again coming off the bottom side of a leaf. So this cross section, I should say long section, well, I guess it could be a cross section or a long section of a leaf. The top surface, of course, is up here and the bottom surface is down here. And so we're seeing the cross section going through a saurus with a bunch of sporangia here. And you can kind of even see some of the spores inside them there. So what's going to be really important is sort of how these sori are presented, what the shape of the sori are, and whether or not the sorus has a covering. Some sori have a covering. Now this one right down here does not have one. Again, we're seeing just a diagram of again what we see over here basically. What we see right here, which is a is a real, again, cross-section of a real leaf, is represented here, basically. This is looking at it from the side, and this is looking at it uh, from the top, looking at directly at the bottom surface of, of the leaf. And there's there's no covering here. There's no covering here. But lots of soil will have some type of covering, and it's called an indusium. So this is showing different types of indusia. So again, those, these diagrams up here are looking at the leaf and cross section, and then these down here are looking at the top of the sorus, basically, again, by looking down at the bottom of the leaf. And we can see some indusia have a central stalk that comes through the sporangia, 
excuse me, comes through the saurus, the middle of the saurus, and then creates a, a roof of sorts. And so when we look at the top of it, we just kind of see the top of this, this roof right here. That's called a peltate one, as you can see. And then sometimes the indusium is attached to the leaf on the side like this. And in some cases, uh, depending upon what the top looks like, it could be called a reniform indusium because it looks kind of like a kidney uh, shape there. Or it could just simply be um, have a lateral, one that's called a lateral indusium because it just comes up from the side and arches over the sporangia. Sometimes the indusia are more cup shaped with, with two um, structures that come up. They don't completely cover it. As we can see here, there's a bit of a hole in the top right here and we can see through. So these all have indusia. And then in other cases, what happens is the sporangia are born along the margins of a pinna. And then what happens is the margin of that pinna recurves over like this to provide sort of protection for the sporangia, because that's, of course, what the indusium is all about, providing protection for those sporangia. But there's not really a true indusium here. It's forming this uh, structure that functions like one by this recurving of the margin of the pinna, uh, a marginal flap, if you will. That's called a false indusium, because that's, again, not really the way indusiums are really made. Okay, and the last thing I'm going to show you up here on this sporangia is some, some ferns, many of them, have an annulus, which is a row of very thickened cells that occurs in the sporangia wall. And what the annulus is for is through the mechanisms of drying out and water pressure and trigger pressure in the sporangia wall. Uh, at, at one point, this will get built up a lot of pressure, and then the pressure releases and the annulus breaks the sporangia case apart, which splits it open. And then as sort of a relapse to that trigger pressure, trigger pressure rushes in and it, the uh, annulus swings forward. And there's a mechanism there that basically throws the spores out of the sporangia. So the ferns, some ferns have a way to actually mechanically throw those spores out to get them further away. All right, any questions there? That is um, all, the, all the morphology for right now. So let's take a look. Uh, and before we get into the species we're gonna look at here, we should probably take a real quick look like we usually do at that table that I made for you. A lot of time and work went into that table. So I just wanna go through it. Some of you maybe have not um, been to one of these before. so. This is the table I'm talking about. It should be on the end of the handout. And so I make these tables to help provide just basic well, nomenclatural information, uh, biogeographical information, where, where the, what the distribution of these species are, what their habitat uh, generally is. And some of the, again, fixes nomenclaturally here. So this first column is the nomenclature according to Florida, North America, which again would pre. Uh, would 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 replace the floor of or the nomenclature of Eilers and Rosa uh, habitat information, and then these dot maps, and then the uh, United United States uh, biogeography with a map from Bon Bonap. So um, these are just a you know, handy guide to help you um, just look up information about these species. If you want to try to find the species, this would be a good way to figure out you know where you need to go. Of course. And these are arranged um, in Eilers and Rosa here. They're arranged by the order they're in Eilers and Rosa. So in Eilers and Rosa, the family Adantiaceae is used. That family is not used in Florida, North America um, for whatever reason. So Florida, North America uses Pteridaceae for those species, some of those species there. Um, and what I also will show you here in this column is what the coefficient of conservatism is, uh, the revised coefficients of conservatism for these species, which is on a scale from one to 10. The higher the coefficient, the more um, fussy the plant is, you might say, uh, more picky it is about the habitat that it uses or it needs, basically. The higher the number, the, the more pristine and less disturbed 
kinds of environments uh, seems to be important for those species. The letter simply means our confidence level, low, medium, or high, in uh, if that number is is right. And you, uh, we can see here is a couple here that are right up there at tens. These these two species here that grow on rock outcrops. And so some of them again are going to be listed, as I said. So I, if it's a listed species, I report what that status is. Pelea atropurpurea, purple clip rake is an endangered species. And I have access to the database that the DNR keeps on these species. So I can at least give you little information. Um, no, no, I'm not going to tell you exactly where these are, but but there's 16 records. That uh, means there's 16 populations that have been uh, observed over the course of uh, all the time that people have been making, co making collections. So even going back to the 1880s or so, if there's a collection someone made in 1880 of this species and it's in the herbarium, then it's a record. So this one only has 16 records. The last observation that anyone has of seeing this species was in 2005. So already 15 years ago. Now that doesn't mean that it's not there anymore because we don't know for sure if anyone's been looking, of course. And that's the other part of this that is hard to quantify, how much looking has, has been done. Really, what has to happen with with this with this database, I think, <clears throat> is someone, and of course the DNR folks, John Pearson and Mark Leschke, don't have the time to do this, but needs to go out and visit revisit these sites and see what the status is. Because undoubtedly, in, in many of these cases, these sixteen populations, some of them are are certainly not present anymore. So we'll just scroll down through here uh, again. I'll, I'll stop and point out a few things. One thing you're going to notice, of course, is the Iowa um, range, the biogeographical range in Iowa. Uh, almost, I mean, a lot of these species are eastern Iowa. And so if you're a person in western Iowa, you don't have nearly as many ferns uh, to enjoy as the folks over in the eastern part of the state do. Obviously, ferns like to be in generally more moist, cool types of environments. Uh, so that's one reason. Here we've got a couple more um, endangered species coming up here. Let's see. Oh, well, first of all, this is one, not endangered, but this is one where we uh, make, make some significant changes with uh, Florida of North America um, in terms of changing not only the family from its spleeny AC to dry up terrid ACE, but also changing the genus from Ethereum to Diplasium. Uh, there were Eilers and Rosa, uh, I think there's at least 25 species uh, in Aspleniaceae. And again, Aspleniaceae went away in four of North America. So all of those had to go to a new family. And most of them went to dry up Teradaceae. Uh, here's some of the Cystopterus, um, about five species there. Some Dryopterus. Here's another threatened one, Intermedia. And this one, um, Again, mainly a Northeast Iowa species, last observed in 2002, only 11 records. I need to get going here so we can get looking at this um, identification. Some of these, like this one right here, Gymnocarpium rubidianum, um, there's a lot of records, 67 records. And so this one, currently listed on special concern, will come off of special concern when the new revised endangered threat and special concern list comes out, which John Pearson is working on. Um, he hopes to get it done by the end of 2023, I think, uh, at least sometime this year. Because if there's more than 40 known populations and there's 67 known populations, well, of course, there's 67 known populations, but what the, the criteria is 40 known populations since 1980. And so that kind of just depends upon what the date of these populations in is when they were when they were seen. But if there's at least 40 known populations that have been observed since 1980, then it will come off a of special concern. So yeah, this is uh, it takes a long time to put this stuff together since there are so many species. Um, here's this from Solipterus, Woodsia. We're gonna be looking at 26 of these species. I didn't indicate which of the 26 on here. You'll have to do that, I guess. But here's another one that's important. So when you see this, uh, Azola, the, the mosquito ferns, 
This one was listed in Islas and Rosa as a Zola Mexicana. Um, they didn't, Islas and Rosa did not include this species, um, which Florida North America calls the Zola Caroliniana. But um, this is a real difficult species to identify. Uh, the mosquito ferns are really small, and you basically have to look at the uh, spore carps, the tissue where the spores are formed, to figure out what you've got here. And, and there's a paper that's cited at the end of this that, that has decided, basically, based on the work that they've done, that instead of, uh, I think, four or five species in North America, we've only really got two. And they use different names. They've corrected the nomenclature. This one is uh, ITIS is, is the source of this, is Zola cristata, and this one is uh, Zola microphylla. This is the one that I think we probably have. Bonap doesn't even show this one in Iowa. Um, this one has uh, more tolerance to cold temperatures, so it would make sense. It's the one that would be likely to go further north than what this one is here. So this one, if we we suppose to have it in Iowa, but again, this is so hard to identify. Um, I'm not sure if anything that's been vouchered is correctly identified. So we really don't know what the distributions are very well with these. But um, if it is, it would be non-native to Iowa because it, it's considered to be, um, again, south of us. So that was a little bit of a difficult one. We have one uh, non-native, uh, European water clover right here. That's why these states are all blue because it's not native. So it's known from at least a couple of sites. I, I photographed it down here. Um, I don't know about that site right there, which I think is um, Story maybe. No, that's Boone, Boone County. Um, that might be right or it might be wrong. Bone app sometimes has uh, inaccurate data. The, the native uh, water clover we have is this species here, which is a threatened species, which only occurs in Lyon County. There's only two records for it, and it hasn't been observed since 1980, so it may not even be around anymore. Bunch of botrychiums, and some of them have changed to different um, genera. Florida of North America still uses botrychium virginianum for rattlesnake fern, but a new version of um, the Botrychium taxonomy uh, puts it into a different genus here, Botrypus or Bo Botrypus. <clears throat> a couple of Ophioglossiums, and then we have our Asmundas. We'll look at all of those, and there's the end and the references. So hopefully this table is of use to you. I'm going to get out of it and Get back to the PowerPoint. We'll start looking at some ID here. <clears throat> All right. There we go. Okay, so we'll start with um, water ferns here because these are really easy to identify. These are plants that don't look anything like ferns. In fact, you probably wouldn't even think they're ferns because they don't look anything like a fern that we're usually used to seeing. So uh, this is the quadrifolia. This is the non-native one. Uh, this is the native one down here, hairy water clover. You can't tell them apart though. You can you can tell it's a water fern or excuse me, a water clover because of the four segments in the leaf right here. It's got four leaflets, just like a four leaf clover of sorts. But it's always kind of, of course going to be in growing in water. The only really way to tell these apart, and you really don't need to because again this one has only been seen in southern Iowa in a couple of places and this one's only been seen in north northwest Iowa but you'd have to pull up the rhizome and look at the rhizome and see which of these two situations is true whether there's roots that are coming off the nodes and uh, along the in, in internodes which is of course between the nodes or if they're just at the nodes so you'd have to dig down into the the substrate which these are growing in to figure that out the other one that's very distinctive and easy then, and again, the, the first couplet you see up here is, is 1A and 1B, which is how you would start to separate off the, the really unusual looking ones. So again, the, the leaves are clover-like with four leaflets or pinnae versus again, leaves are pinnately lobed or compound like most ferns are, or the leaves are simple like some ferns, or they're two-lobed. And the two-lobed is what 
happens with azola here. <clears throat> These have little tiny leaves, very small as you can see here, and they have two little lobes on them. The whole plant is tiny. It's a plant that floats on the surface of the water, and it's this stuff right in here. It's growing in amongst some, uh, probably some lemna and some wolfia. And so this stuff is not what we're looking at. It's this stuff here with the darker green color and a little bit of purple pinkish coloration. Uh, this one is, as I said, probably a Zola caroliniana. I photographed this in Iowa. So it's probably, again, the, the native species then. Now, if the leaves are bigger than two centimeters, and again, they more look like a regular fern, and we're gonna go on to 2B, and that's, again, all other ferns, and I say C number three, which is number three is right here, and so now we've separated out three species here that are very distinctly different from all other ferns. That's, that's what this key is trying to do. You always try to get the ones that are really odd, sort of, get them out of the way first. So now we have all the other ferns left then. All other ferns are still left. And now we're gonna make a separation based on the number of fronds, the number of actual fern leaves in a, in a single plant. And so this is another rule basic division. It's easy to see. It's gonna separate out a whole complete family here because Ophioglossaceae always have just one frond. The plant just has one frond. Now that leaf, that single leaf, that frond is, is divided along the petiole uh, into two parts. Um, we wouldn't call those, well, you could call them different pinnae basically, um, which I have called them that right here. One of them is a trophophore. That's the one that does photosynthesis. And the other is fertile pinnae. Uh, that means it is the place where the spores are produced. And we call that then a sporophore. That characterizes Ophioglossaceae. Now, if a, if a fern plant has fronds that are two or more, uh, then it's all other ferns. That's what AOF means. That means that goes into all the other ferns that are still left yet. So what we're gonna do now is go ahead and look at Ophioglossaceae and just look at a couple, um, well, after several species, four species here. And, now I'm, I'm going back to 1A and 1B because now we're in Ophioglossaceae, we're in that family. And we're gonna say, you know, look at 1A up here and say, um, well, is the vegetation, the vegetative portion of the leaf, again, that trophophore, is it pinnately compound or is it simple? If it's pinnately compound, it's potrichium. If it's simple, like these leaves right here, it's Ophioglossum. So again, these leaves we see right here, these are pinnately co compound. We can see that they're divided into smaller pinnae. Also, <clears throat> we can also look at the sporangia and if the sporangia are, have little stalks on them. In, this, in these plants, the sporangia are born, again, on this specialized pinnae, basically, that, again, doesn't have any blade to it. The blades are completely reduced to just a real small part barely covering any of the sporangia. So the sporangia are very visible here. They occur right out in the open. <clears throat> but on, in botrychiums, they have little short stalks on them. Um, can't really see them here, but they have little short stalks on them. Whereas over in Ophioglossum, I'll go ahead and pull this down for now. Um, here again are the simple leaves. The Sporangia are encased, sort of sunken into the axis of that sporophore. All right, so I'll go get that out of the way. So we, we're going to look at three botrychiums here. And so the, the most common one is, is this one here, Botrychium virginianum, the rattlesnake fern. Uh, another one that you would certainly come across possibly is Botrychium dissectum, the uh, dissected grape fern. And then I also put in Botrychium campestre. This is the prairie moon wart that was discovered in Iowa in about 19, what was it, 76 or so, something like that. <clears throat> so the way you'd separate um, Virginianum here from Dissectum would be, uh, you can pretty much do it by gestalt. Uh, they really have a quite different look to them. Uh, you can see kind of what the whole plant looks like here. Um, but the key uses the trophophore again. So using the, the trophophore, well, actually, we, 
The trophophores are pretty similar. There is a little bit of a difference in them. It's better to look at the sporophore. So the sporophore again is this part. And sporophore is shown up right here. In Botrychium, the sporophore is, um, arises right here at the base of the trophophore. The trophophore base is right here and the sporophore arises at that point. Um, it's at an elevated position basically on the stalk or on the stipe. And in dissectum, uh, the sporophore, when it's present, originates near the ground, almost right near the ground. Uh, it's not elevated up uh, higher as it is in Virginianum. Another thing that happens is uh, dissectum, it will have leaves that persist during the winter time. And they'll look kind of like this, as a, this, this is a, a plant going into fall. And so they turn a kind of a bronze, brown, reddish, purplish kind of color, but they will persist over the winter months. Uh, you know, you can, you can see them they push the snow away, whereas the leaves in Virginium do not persist. Now, Botrychium campestre is just very different from anything else. It's just so tiny and, and so small. This is the entire plant right here. It has a trophophore that's just minuscule right here, because this whole plant would be about maybe three inches or so tall at, at the most. And then it has the sporophore is over here, right there. Everything's just really small. <clears throat> and again, this is a plant that was discovered in Iowa. It was when it was discovered, it was it was new discovery for science, and it was discovered in the Los Hills, hence the prairie moon. Well, again, Ophioglossum, uh, there's two species, but one of them is really rare. It's only found in southeast Iowa. And this one is uh, not easy to find either, but uh, this is Ophioglossum pusillum, the northern um, adder's tongue. That's the one, most likely one you'd see. And again, it's very distinct with that simple leaf here. All right, um, three easy ones coming up here next. We won't have to spend too much time on these. These are all in the family Esbondaceae. And you see again, 4A and 4B. I put this in here if you, you know, want to try to have some help with what it is that makes this distinction. Uh, and it's, you know, unfortunately, it's got a lot of botanical terminology. Uh, there's not an easy way to get around that. But the way that we would split these this family as Bundacee off from all the other ferns now, uh, which again, we had, we had all the other ferns back here, right here, all other ferns, C number four to continue. Now we would look at the sporangia there and see how large the sporangia is, what the diameter of it is. And you can kind of, again, just look at it in terms of, you can see it without magnification basically versus the sporangia in 4B, these are gonna be really small. Some of them um, are not very easy to see at all with, with your eyes. The other thing is in Osmondaceae, the leaves are clearly dimorphic or at least with strongly dimorphic fertile pinnae. What this means is the fronds, multiple fronds are coming up from a common uh, root system from one ry rhizome. So the the, the plant is multi-frond, multi-leaves. But some of the leaves, again, are photosynthetic. So those are trophophylls. And some of the leaves, these brown things, are or spore-producing only, so are sporophylls. And that's the case with cinnamon fern. You can see here, um, very, very different uh, fronds. Um, and also a couple other things. Uh, these are pretty big plants. So the the uh, both the sporophores and the troph excuse me the sporophylls and the trophophylls are pretty large. And if you really need something to help you just nail it clearly, if you look on the trophophylls again the photosynthetic leaves. If you look at the you're going at the rachis here and where a pinnae attaches to the rachis. You see these yellow arrows are pointing to a very clear, conspicuous tuft of little hairs, which is something that, again, um, cinnamon fern has that these two do not have. 
The other two, again, uh, again, all of these are Osman here. So all three of these have this characteristic. Um, what separates, uh, and, be, and because Osmunda separates off more clearly from these two, it, and some, some uh, taxonomists have actually put it in a different genus, Osmundastrum, but um, for, North, for North America has not done that. Of course, that's, that's been done since 1993, and that's another thing about for North America and the fern treatment is that it's old. Again, that came out in 1993. So there has been a lot of um, molecular work been done since then that is starting to, again, change the taxonomy from what for North America has. But the um, other two species, um, the regal fern and interrupted fern are pictured right here. On this one, again, the Sporangia are produced on a frond that does have does not have any kind of photosynthetic tissue. Every bit of these fronds is basically non-photosynthetic. It's all devoted to making spores. These two over here have their sporangia on fronds that are at least partly photosynthetic. In the case of Osmunda regalis here, uh, the sporangia, which we can see up here at the top, are at the tip of a frond. The lower part of this frond is photosynthetic. And of course, um, if you have, and this is what really helps, of course, to identify these species is if they do have sporangia. Um, if you don't have sporangia, then Osmunda claytonia can be a little bit challenging. But if you got sporangia, then it's another very easy one because uh, it's called interrupted fern because the sporangia are produced on pinna. The pinna become entirely devoted to sporangia. And so, but it's right in the middle, basically, of the fronds, sort of in the middle of the fronds. So you got pinna below and pinna above that are photosynthetic. So again, both of these have fronds that are partly photosynthetic and partly um, devoted to producing sporangia. And again, the way you tell them apart is where the sporangia are. It's also true that Osmunda regalis here is, um, it's got uh, twice pinnate leaves. It's hard to see in this picture here. Maybe you can see it better down here. Oh yeah, we can see it much better down here. So this is one frond right here. And we can see it's got twice pinnate because this is the primary rachis here. And then there's a secondary rachis going out here. Whereas uh, Asmunda petonii uh, is once pinnate. It may look like it's almost twice pinnate, but it's not because the divisions in these pinna do not go far enough down to the mid vein to be considered um, making another pinnule. So it's, these are pinna, but they're just deeply lobed. Uh, I threw this in because this was on one of the websites, but this might be a helpful characteristic too. The venation in the pinna of Osmunda claytonia interrupted fern are dichotomously branching, which means they start out and then they, dip, they branch into two veins. And that's what the yellow lines are trying to show you there. Okay, let's move on to... Um, Another family here. So we're looking at 5A now. So again, if we go back to this one, it says all other ferns, C5A. So we're at 5A now. And now we're gonna be looking at where the sporangia are. Uh, 5A and 5B are, are separating out on the base of, basis as if the, if the sporangia are marginal along the margin of the pinna. Whoops, <clears throat> uh, I lost my place here. Or, and then because they're on the margin of the pinna, they the margin of that pinna is usually reflexed over. And so these have a false indusium. Whereas 5B, the sporangia are more in discrete sori, uh, someplace on the leaf surface, um, not necessarily by the margin. They could be any place towards the mid vein. But if they are near the margin, then they have a true indusium. They do not have this reflexed pinna margin. 
that forms a false indusium. So that's going to be all other ferns. And again, we're going to go to number nine to continue on there. Uh, we're going to go ahead and take care of these now that come off right here. And there's going to be two families that come off here. Then Stadiataceae, which only has one species in it, which is the bracken fern, which is pictured right here. And you separate it from the other family, Pteridaceae, on the basis basically of the, the shape of those fronds. The leaves, the blades on bracken fern are very triangular or deltoid in shape. Um, the petioles uh, are light colored, you know, tan, straw colored to light brown. You won't you won't see the rhizomes unless you dig them up. So you know whether you use this or not. But the rhizomes between Denstadiaceae and Pteridaceae are different. You can see here they're hairy and lack scales. We're down here. They have scales and lack hair, so just the opposite. But down here in the Pteridaceae, uh, without looking at the rhizomes, the, the leaf blades are more linear or lanceolate. They could be very narrowly triangular, or in some cases, they're almost circular in outline. That's the maidenhair fern. But the real thing that's helpful here, I think, probably is the petioles. All of these, and it's gonna, we're going to look at three genera here, they all have petioles and often then the rachi too, because the rachi is extension of that, that are dark brown, kind of a dark reddish brown, purple brown, even somewhat black. And that's going to be again, again, this is sort of a gestalt thing because bracken fern is a much bigger uh, fern plant than any of these species down here. And again, just looks entirely different. So that's where again, gestalt can come in and help you a lot. You just get a, a, a photographic impression you know, of what that species looks like. Uh, and so again, the bracken fern is pictured here. Um, here it does kind of tend to have like these three um, rachi that come off of it, off of the um, um, stipe. Usually there's sort of three of them and each of these then have that triangular shape to them. Um, let's see. Oh, there's this is the this picture. Of course, is showing a close up of what the uh, pinules look like. So that, again, it's a it's a pretty um, easy one to, to figure out because again, it's only it's only species in this family, and basically, this description right here is is what um, shows you. You can see down here. On this picture here, hopefully you can see the false indusium. Here we can see there's a light color along the margin of the leaf right here. Um, here, it's it, this is as the sauri are beginning to form, uh, or the the the, the sporangia, I should say, along the margin. This one shows them much further along. This picture right here, and and you, now we can see that um, false indusium a little bit better. The other ones here, um, Pteridaceae, we're going to look at three genera, as I said here, and these are pretty easy ones as well. These are all kind of just gestalt ones. Here's the key that separates them. Uh, we're going to separate off maidenhair for adiantum here by the shape of the pinules being more wedge-shaped. And... And, and basically, again, this, this characteristic up here, the, the blades kind of being circular outline um, is very helpful when you uh, see a picture of the plant here coming up in just a little bit. So the wedge-shaped pinules versus the linear or oblong triangular-shaped ones um, will take us to Chelanthes and Peleia. Then separating these two out, it's just basically the size of those. Pinules. Let's go ahead and go to the um, next slide because that will show. Uh, um, adiantum here. And adiantum is a really easy one to uh, learn to identify. I'm sure most of you probably know what this one looks like. I put this purple line in right here because this is the stipe. You can't see it very well because it's so dark colored. The, the shadows here, it's hard to see it. So this is the stipe. Again, uh, the petiole, if you will, coming up from the rhizome. 
And then what happens is the leaf sort of divides into these two arching branches and they're both symmetrical. It had, so it just has this very unique growth form in terms of what the frond looks like. It has kind of a unique way it grows because these kind of grow and arch as they grow. And then these, these um, pinnae come off of that axis uh, on one side, basically coming off on that, all on that side or coming off all on this side. And here again, you can see that wedge shape as I was describing the wedge shape of the pinules. Here's a picture of, uh, again, the wedge shape that they were describing. And here's a picture of the false inducia. Remember, these all have false inducia. Again, so we're looking at the bottom side of these pinules here, and we're seeing, again, a margin of that pinule recurved over, covering up the sporangia. For chelanthes, I mean, there's, it can't really be a, a fern easier to identify just on gestalt than this one right here. Helanthes and the next one, um, Palaea, always almost are growing on rock. This is a, a tuft growing on a, a rock outcrop here. Here's an example, of, <clears throat> excuse me, of one of the uh, fronds. Uh, there is a lot of hair, a lot of pubescence on these little uh, fronds. And the ultimate segments that we see in here are really small. You remember the, um, the key back there said uh, the, oops, uh, I lost my key here. Yeah, the well, the largest size of these ultimate segments are like one to three millimeters or so. Yeah, I guess it's, uh, the pineal is less than one centimeter long and less than two millimeters wide. So everything is just really small on, on, on this thing. And it's got a lot of hairs on both surfaces, on the underside and on the top. There's more on the bottom side. There's lots of hairs on the rachis right in here, as you can see. Here's where the um, sori are again. And they're not... They're not covered very well with a false indusia. There's, there's a weakly developed one here, but they kind of uh, are lined up in this U shape because of the shape of the margin here. So these little lobes right here, if we were to look on the underside, this is what we would see here. Palaea, the uh, other one that grows on rock, um, again, it's gonna have pinules that are more than one centimeter long. We can see these right here. And they're definitely more than one cent centimeter long and they're more than five millimeters wide. So everything's just a lot bigger and they don't have nearly as much hair. They might have a little bit of pubescence in places, uh, but nothing like you see up here. Uh, <clears throat> they have, again, both of these are gonna have that purplish um, stipe or purplish uh, petiole and also purplish or brownish purplish um, rake eye. A couple more pictures there again in here again false inducia again same thing so all of these in uh, in this family here uh, pteridaceae uh, are all going to be like that with a false inducia. All right moving on to um, a couple other important groups so Drop pteridase, this is where the key stops because things really get complicated with the key at this point. In 9A and 9B, um, the key, uh, I was using the Missouri Flora key, now separates off this very big family, Dryopteridaceae. Mostly the Spleniaceae and others are also went to Dryopteridaceae. So Dryopteridaceae is very diverse. It has a lot of different uh, genera in it. And so the key gets really complicated because Dryopteridaceae keys out like three, at least three different places. So I'm not going to try to keep keying. What I'm saying right here is the first point where Dryopteridaceae comes off, it's using this, uh, again, kind of another characteristic we used before, the leaves or the fronds being strongly dimorphic. They're being, um, again, a fertile leaf uh, that's really dense and contracted with sporangia. Uh, the pinules even 
becoming condensed and, and wrapping around. They're much smaller, but they become condensed and kind of wrap around this, the uh, sori. Versus over here, the leaves may be monomorphic. That means they're all the same, or they may be somewhat dimorphic. But if they are dimorphic, the fertile, again, those fertile leaf blades uh, do not have pinnules that wrap around the sori. And, and it's another important characteristic I left off of this is that in the 9A group here, which is going to take us to Onoclea and Metusia, those are the two genera, and there's just one species in Iowa for each of those. Uh, the, uh, the other kind of important characteristic here is that the sporangia get dark colored, black colored. You can see that. Um, there's a, so in this picture right here, uh, here's the Tro the trophophils, the photosynthetic fronds. And then here is a shorter uh, sporophyll. So this is a, you know, a, a separate frond, but this frond is totally devoted to producing spores. And there's what, what they look like when they're first produced, but they'll, they'll get very black and dark looking and they'll pers persist over the winter time. Um, Onoclea sensibilis, which is this one right here, is again, it's a pretty easy one to identify because of the dimorphism here again in these fronds, the persistence of the uh, sporophylls and how dark they get. And the uh, trophophylls, the photosynthetic fronds, do have sort of a characteristic and pretty easy to identify look. There again, one that is pinnate, pinnatophid. Because down here at the bottom, they are completely divided into a separate pinna. But as we get up here towards the top, we see there's leaf tissue in here again that makes them just deeply lobed rather than divided. So that's a pretty easy characteristic. Uh, for Matusia, so again, Matusia is over here on the right now. This is ostrich fern. It too has very big fronds. Another important difference here basically is the, um, between these two, if you needed something else, is the photosynthetic fronts here are widest towards the base. The photosynthetic fronds over here are widest in the middle. The, there's a much, there's a very strong taper going down towards the base. So widest in the middle here, widest towards the base over here, but again, they look very different. You really don't need to use that characteristic, but uh, it's there. These are very big uh, fern fronds and they grow uh, in a circle, basically. The fronds come off of the rhizome in a circular pattern and over in the um, sensitive fern, they come off the rhizome more in a linear way. So what happens over here is that that circular uh, production of fern fronds makes very large vase-like plants. These are very attractive plants. And in fact, they, they are used um, as ornamentals. But then the, whoops, sorry, I went the wrong way. Here is the furrow fronds beginning to develop in the center of that vase, basically. And then here's the fertile fronds much later after they've uh, matured and, and fully grown up. And again, like Onoclea, they get dark colored, the sporangia get dark colored and they persist. So pretty similar in many ways, um, but also very different in some very easy ways to distinguish them. All right, next one, uh, we're gonna look at another pretty common one here. Um, we're sticking with Dryopteridaceae, but, oh, and the other part of this key up here, I should point out, so 9B, again, you know, is what we use to separate Onoclea and Matusia off from the rest of the Dryopteridaceae. And so what I'm saying here is that you know, again, if they don't have that characteristic we described over here with the sporangia and, and the, the pineals wrapping around and becoming dark and black colored, um, that's not going to happen over here. They don't do that over here. That's all other ferns, but also other Dryopteridaceae. That's where the key gets complicated. But one thing that helps to separate the dry up of the other Dryopteridaceae off from the other ferns that would be continuing again 
with us here in 9a are these two things right here. If the sori uh, have indusia, true indusia, and if the sori are somewhat hooked or U-shaped, that's going to point to, again, um, a dry up pteridaceae. Or if the plant has or does not have stiff needle-like hairs on the fronds, that will help point towards uh, dry up pteridaceae. Uh, that might be helpful. What we're going to look at here is another real common one that you uh, certainly we want to be able to identify lady fern, Ethereum felix femina. Uh, it's going to have your, your basic fern look to it, uh, a sort of a delicate uh, frond with uh, fairly dissected. These can be anywhere from two to three times pinnately compound. So your typical, I would just say, <laughs> sort of typical looking frond, but a couple of things. So the stipe, always usually has these scales on it. These are bigger than hairs. We not call them hairs because they have a, a certain amount of width to them that makes them look like narrow scales, these brown scales then that occur on the, on the site. And then the other important thing is that characters I just described you see the sori here and the indusia. These have indusia that are covering. These have indusia that is a lateral indusia. It comes up from the side of the uh, sporangia and comes up and covers up the sporangia. But you can see it's U-shaped. At least some of them are. In fact, you can see it really strongly right here. So again, now we can see the indusia, this membrane right here, which comes up from one side. And we can see all kinds of sporangia. The sporangia are actually just pushing their way out, basically, of this covering. But again, this one is sort of hook-shaped. Is this longer on this side? Kind of a hook shape there. This one's kind of U-shaped. So if you have sporangia and the indusia there, uh, that's a really good way to make sure you've got lady fern. Now, the other I'm going to pair up with it here. Uh, so there's only one Ethereum now in Iowa because the other Ethereums have been changed to either Diparia, as you see here, or Di Di Diplasium. And so we're looking at Diparia acrostichoides here, which is a silvery spleen wart. It's, it keys out pretty close to Ethereum because it's got some similarities. Uh, again, it's got that same kind of Typical fern, delicate fern, frond look, uh, several fronds kind of coming out from a clump like this. So just again, from a distance, uh, they're gonna look kind of alike there. But when you look at the stipe, look how pubescent and hairy the stipe is with more uh, slender hairs really, not so much scales. Very distinctive there. Then even up in the rachis, the rachis over here uh, in Ethereum is not very hairy or anything. It might be a few, you know, might be slightly pub pubescent in places. The rachis over here is noticeably conspicuously ha ha hairy. And the here on the sporangia and the indusia again, it's linear. We don't have any kind of U or hook shape that we have over here. So all well, these do kind of look alike uh, in their, you know, from a distance, uh, closer look at the pinna, looking at the stipe um, will help separate them. And again, uh, both of them are gonna be at least, uh, excuse me, at least twice pinnately count compound. The other one that used to be a theorem is pycnocarpin. That was one I had pictured in the front. And here's, so here's it, dysplasium, pycnocarpium is the name now. <clears throat> and this blade is only once pinnate compound, uh, which again is gonna be different from the other two. And the upper part of the uh, stipe, or this is probably what we're looking at here, the upper part of the stipe, uh, really not much in the way of any scales, not much in the way of any hairs. So if you look uh, closer at the 
pinna, so again, this is one spinately compound. So this is the primary rachis right here with just a single uh, segment coming off. Um, that's a very, very easy way, again, to distinguish this species. And they often have this, um, this is calling it an oracle, which is what most uh, floras do call this. Usually oracles are little ear-like flaps, and usually they occur in pairs, but this one doesn't occur in pairs. Uh, but it has this little lobe or oracle at the uh, base of the pinna. And again, looking at one that's got sporangia and the indusium, uh, very linear in, in shape, very dense too. But here again is the oracle. What I'm going to uh, compare with it here is um, in a different genus, Polystichum acrostichoides. This is Christmas fern. So here's just a gestalt look at it uh, growing out in the in the forest. It's going to be a lot smaller plant than what um, displays him is. But it's going to have some similarities, so that's why I paired them up. It uh, it's described as having dimorphic fronds whereas dysplasium has monomorphic fronds. And the reason these are dimorphic fronds is because some of the fronds that produce sporangia, they produce them on the pinna out here at the end, and they get a lot smaller. Other fronds that do not have any sporangia on them would not have this reduction in pinna size that we see here. So they are essentially slightly dimorphic, depending upon whether the uh, frond is producing sporangia or not. So that's one thing there, and, and they're uh, very slender, but they are one spinately compound too, just like this species is, one spinately compound. And they do have a little bit of an oracle. Here we can see a good picture of it. Uh, they tend to have these little spines though, that dysplasium does not have. You can see these little spines that come off the margin of the of the pinna here. And they have pubescence on the on the um, rachis. We don't see any pubescence on the rachis up here. And these are again just they're also smaller plants. And they are densely packed with um, sporangia that are more round, more spherical in shape. And they have a, I think they have a uh, I'm not sure. No, I think they might have a peltate uh, type of indusium, uh, but I, I'm pretty sure it's not a lateral indusium that we see over here. All right. Well, we're, we're getting close to the, oh, we're already over some, so we need to finish up, I guess. I got um, just a couple more slides. So Dryoptera dacee, we're looking at a couple of species of Dryopteris here. There's, there's several Dryopteris, but a couple of more common ones. Cristata is the first one we see here. Uh, it is uh, pretty distinctive as Dryopteris goes because the it's a fairly small plant in terms of the size of the fronds, first of all, compared to um, Goldie's fern, which is coming up uh, as a comparison here. But the thing I want to point out that uh, does help with this one is the pinna uh, are often slightly bent, sort of, they are attached to the rachis here these pinna, and then they're kind of twisted. They're kind of, the, the some keys describe it as like, like a Venetian blind. The blind's kind of twisted, of course, uh, and not parallel with the window. And that's what's kind of happening here. These are kind of twisted so that they're not parallel. The, the, the blade is not parallel with the rachis. Uh, here's just some close-ups of the sori. Or just so you could you could use these to compare. The other one I'm comparing it with here is Dryoptros goldiana, Goldie's fern, which is a, has much larger uh, fronds and is a much bigger fern, a fern plant. It is, and you might confuse this with some other things, of course. But look at the um, bottom of the fronds here, where the stipe is. It's got these very conspicuous scales, actually kind of a mixture of scales and some hairs. That's pretty conspicuous there. The fronds are 
um, pretty large. They, they, I've noticed they kind of have this kind of unique sort of taper at the tip like this, where there's a kind of elongate taper coming out there at the end. And here's a closer up of the um, sori on, on it. All right, and then we we'll look at a couple of cystopterus. Um, <clears throat> two species that are going to be pretty commonly found, cystopterus bulbifera. Uh, I've got two pictures here of the plant, basically. You sometimes see this species, uh, and this is bulbet fern, uh, producing these really long, long, slender, tapering fronds especially when they're growing on a rock outcrop and they kind of just rock outcrop, excuse me, and they're just kind of hanging down here like this. So that's, that's somewhat helpful. Here's another plant that's not growing in the same kind of situation there, so it doesn't look quite the same. Um, here's a picture of the um, glands, both glands and hairs on the rachis. So again, this rachis that's in through here, close up of that. Here's a close up of a pinna about in the middle part of the rachis here. And there's some glands. And then this, the veins on these plants end in the little notches. You can see there's a notch right there and there's a notch right there. They end in the notches rather than going to the tip of the lobes. They, the notches between the lobes or the glands end. If you need, need, need even more, these produce bulbs. <laughs> That's why they're called bulblet fern. And so it, on most fronds, you will probably find a few of these fairly large spherical green masses of tissue or, or little, like a bulb, basically. Uh, a bulb, uh, what a bulb really is, or what the definition of a bulb is, is it's leaf tissue, of course, that's, that's used to reproduce, help reproduce a plant. Uh, a bulb on a onion plant, for example, and that's leaf, leaf tissue. So these are like that in being composed of leaf tissue, but they're really, really small. So bulblet is a term that's used there. So um, if you see the little bulblets on the, on the under surfaces, again, they're gonna be on the bottom side. This is showing the bottom side of a, a frond, like maybe right in through here or right through in here, the pinna, where we can see both bulblets and sporangia. And what this little, uh, inset is showing you is that the indusia on these sporangia, on the saurus, here's a saurus, here's a saurus, and there's a, again, a laterally attached indusia. The indusia have glandular hairs on them. So there's just, there's a, lots of things that you can use to, to pin this one down. The most common cystopterus, though, that you will see out and about is cystopterus protrusa, this one right here. And um, it could be confused with some other cystopterus that we have. We have several, and some of them are um, pretty uncommon. <clears throat> cystopterus fragilis, for example, or tenuous. This one is, is the, by far the most common. This one you'll find in, in lots of different forests. If you look at the distribution map for it, you'll see that. Here again is just a look at the fronds in general. They're, they're pretty short, small fronds. This is a very small plant, but it, you'll see it again growing in patches like this on slopes and forests. Here's a picture of the uh, upper part of the stipe. There's a few tiny little scales here. Just, you know, just a few scattered little scales. One there, there's one there, there's one right there. Now the key uses um, something related to the rhizomes. Now you don't really probably need to do this unless you want to really make sure it's not a, a more uncommon species of cystopterus like tenuous. But the key in Florida, Missouri will use the this characteristic right here, which so you have to pull up a clump of plants basically so you can see the rhizome. Remember the rhizome is the underground stem. It's the, it's the perinating part of the fern. It's where the leaves come off of because it is a stem tissue. The leaves are coming off of the stem in a clump right here. And if you pull up uh, enough of this to, to see Cystopterus protrusa, what happens here is these rhizomes are fairly long and creeping. That's why it gives its name protrusa, I think. But they, the leaves are clustered together at a point some distance away from the tip. Here's the tip of the rhizome, and here's where the leaves are coming off the rhizome. 
So there's this distance in here. The key says anywhere from one to five centimeters. So this one was probably like, well, I don't have a key here or a scale for sure, but it's probably more like two or three, maybe, maybe four, not sure exactly, but easily recognizable as the leaves are coming off at a, in a clump that's quite a ways away from the tip. Now, the other option, of course, is the leaves are clustered at the tip. So this tip would just be barely sticking out here. If, if the tip of the rhizome is just barely perceptible from the clump, where the clump is coming off of the rhizome, then it's either Cystopteris tenuis or tenusiensis, which would be uh, species that are, again, not nearly as common. There's just a couple uh, examples of how the fronds can look a, a little bit different, of course. There's natural variation there in uh, those pinna. And here's a close-up of the sori. All right, we've got, I think, one more here. Yeah, this is it, 15. And these are two easy ones, pretty easy ones. The first one here, now, now we're actually looking at a different family, a Spleniaceae, where we've moved out of Dryopteridaceae, and we're looking at the Spleniaceae. And the first one here is a Splenium rhizophyllum. This is the walking fern. It's a very distinct fern. Uh, you can kind of see a couple of pictures of the plants right here. Uh, the pinnae are very long, lancelate shape. They have a couple little uh, lobes, you would call these almost oracles here at the base. You can see those two lobes right there. And it's called walking fern because the tips of these long lance shaped fronds can get very elongate. Here's one coming out here. Uh, here's, an, again, you can see these getting out a ways. These down here, there's some that are very long. Uh, here's a tip right here from a, a frond. We can't even see all of it, but here's the tip coming. Look how long that tip is. These tips will grow out and arch over and root and start a new plant. And that's why it's called walk, walking fern, because it, it's sort of like the plant is taking a step with the length of those fern fronds and, and establishing a, a, a new plant. Of course, it's going to be a clone of, of, of that plant. So that's a pretty easy one. There's again the fronds. So it's it's just going to be a simple leaf. Here's the sori on a very, again, lancelate uh, lobe leaf at the base. There's what the sori look like. The other one is a splenium platyneuron, the ebony spleen wart. So there's what the plant looks like. It's going to have um, uh, once pinnate fronds. It has these little lobes, uh, usually on both sides of the pinnae here, two little triangular lobes you can see right there, pretty distinctive. The closer up of those, and again, there's the sori bunch of sori packed in there on the undersurface of those pinnae. So that's that's it. Went through quite a few species there. So probably should have narrowed it down to a few more, I suppose, but oh well. Thanks, Tom. Um, see one hey. question right now. MJ asks, yeah. are there two species of ostrich ferns in Iowa, native and non-native? Not that I know of. Um, I, there was only one, of course, listed in Iris Rosa. And the way to look, uh, I guess, and figure that out for sure would be to look at flora of North America and see if there's anything listed there. I can do that real quick. So, Matusia. In Florida, North America, this only one species, Strothiopterus. Now, does that mean that's, you know, again, this is 1993, so um, maybe if, if there is, it's not native because it would be something that would have been introduced, I suppose, or, or it would be one that someone has split out. Again, there are, um, let's see. There might be different um, varieties of it, which it means that 
is possible someone has split up those apart, but it doesn't look like it. It doesn't look like there are there are three species worldwide. Flora of North America says there are three species worldwide, but there's only one in the flora of North America. And this, again, unless it needs to be updated. Um, somebody asked, what guide do you recommend for fern, rec for fern identification? Oh, I was going to put a slide up that would show some of those. There's quite a few um, guides out there for ferns. Uh, well, I know when I keep ferns, I, I always use a flora. Um, that's what I do. But there are more user-friendly guides, certainly, out there with more pictures and not-so-technical types of keys. Um, one of them, if I can, I have a slide here on my other computer. I can, I think I can find it here quick. Um, I've got some books on my shelf, quite a few books on my shelf. I could probably pull out and show you some of those, but let's see here. Midwestern Ferns, this is, um, oh, that's, that's just a website it looks like. Mm -hmm. Let me look at another one here. Okay, yeah, there's a book called Midwest Ferns by Steve Chaddy, C-H-A-D-D-E. I think he's he's done other field guides. The name Chaddy sounds familiar. Uh, Midwest Ferns, a field guide to the ferns and fern relatives of North Central United States. So you'd always want to try and get something, of course, that's regional to the Midwest. You And that's the advantage, of course, of getting one of these other things, well, like, you know, Florida, Missouri, of course, it's just for Missouri, but if you know that means that some things in Iowa may not be there, and so a more regional approach, you know, is helpful there. And again, if you want one that's got more pictures, not so much technical keys and stuff, then these books, Midwest Ferns, and then there's another one called The Field Manual of Ferns and Fern Al Allies by David Lellinger. That's the one that Don Farrar uses in his fern class is the field manual of ferns and fern allies of the United States and Canada. Or at least he, he did use, he doesn't teach that class anymore, but David Lellinger. And I could, I could put together some things in an email and send it to Lance um, that he could send to all of you. I didn't get around to uh, getting a slide with some pictures of these guides. That sounds good to me. Um, the only other question I have is, um, when do the ferns typically start producing spores? Yeah, well, imagine that, you know, like with any plant, there's phenology there. Um, it's frustrating when they aren't producing spores because then, you know, you can't use the saurus. And quite often, you know, the saurus is going to be very helpful and induce them. All that stuff is missing. So, I haven't talked much about identifying ferns in that vegetative state. And again, it's certainly possible that one can develop uh, some expertise there by just developing the gestalt, you know, and recognize them. But from my experience, I always like to have sporangia just to make sure. Um, it's probably going to be, of course, a few, at least four to eight weeks after the plant begins growth. Um, and, and so when does that happen, of course? Well, then there's probably gonna uh, some phenology there in terms of if it's first thing in the spring or if it's first thing June, beginning of part of June. And I can't, you know, I don't know for sure. I, that's something that you'd have to look up uh, basically. And that's what some of these books would probably be good for. And even for North America would be good in that regard, just looking up, um, you know, basically when when they begin growth and when sporangia begin to form. It's going to vary, I'm sure, you know, and, and something 
that should be looked up. And they don't always produce sporangia. So look around for other plants. All right, I think that's all the questions we got. All right, good. Did we get some favorites in the uh, chat? Yep, so uh, let's see. Maidenhair, Walker's first. There's two of them there. Okay. Fern. Oh, Adder's Tongue, Sensitive Fern, yep. Sensitive Fern, Walking Fern, that, yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, you gotta like Maidenhair. That's, that's a very attractive one. Nice one to do photography with because you can really try to you know use the patterns that you see there. All right, well, I got a few in there. We didn't talk much about fiddleheads, but that's another aspect of you know how ferns grow. And I didn't talk about the fern life cycle, so we didn't get a chance to look at that. But another time. Yep. Why need to do a fern workshop sometime? That'd be the, a good way to do it. Just get out there and look at them for real. Yeah. Well, again, thanks everybody for coming by tonight and um, hope you have a good rest of the evening and good weekend coming up. Yeah, thanks, Tom. You too. Thanks for joining tonight. Bye. See ya.